evaluation after the program. If you run into any technical issues throughout, please either email me and I'll put my email in the chat or message me in the chat and I will do my best to respond and help you troubleshoot. So without further ado, I'm going to start with our first speaker. Carolyn Carey Marshner is an Extension Associate at Cornell University. Carey has been with the New York State Hemlock Initiative since 2015, where she coordinates NYSHI's outreach efforts, works with partners to facilitate conservation planning and assist with program management. So please welcome Carrie Marshner. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you for inviting us to talk about hemlock bullied adelgid in the Skinny Alice watershed. Um, the New York State Hemlock Initiative works mostly on developing biological control options for hemlock bullied algid in New York State. Um, but I am the lucky one who gets to have the job of working with our partners and doing a lot of our outreach, which I really enjoy. Let's see if I can move on here. There. <laughs> so hemlock trees. Let's think about them a little bit. This is where hemlocks are in. New York State, uh, the darker the color, the more hemlocks there are. So you can see that in the Lake Plain, it doesn't look like there's a lot of hemlocks. They're actually there, um, hiding in the gorges mostly, and there's actually quite a few along the lake shore. Um, but in the in the main part uh, that's farmland, there's not a ton of them because it's farmland. And then in the southern tier, um, there's quite a bit. And then Catskills, the Adirondacks, and the southwestern port, part of Tug Hill, you can see those um, almost red areas that where the, hem the forest is 60% or greater hemlock. This is, he this is hemlocks. Their bark is rough and furrowed and brown. Their foliage is lacy and feathery, evergreen, of course. Their needles are short and flat with rounded tips and the undersides have a white stripe held opposite each other on the branch, which is different from like a balsam fir. There's the white stripes on the underside. The cones are very small, about an inch and a half long um, and rounded. They're a mint green when they're growing and then they turn this nice red brown when they're mature. And they're what we call a foundation species, which means they create the ecosystem that others, other plants and animals depend on. They fill a, a unique niche in our, in our ecosystem because they are our most shade adapted evergreen. Um, each one of those needles is specially adapted to, to photosynthesize and make energy even from the sun flecks that come in through a fairly dense tree canopy. So they can live as saplings for over a hundred years, just hanging out, waiting for a chance um, for, for a gap so that they can grow up and become a mature tree. So they, um, they're, they're a forest, they're a, they're a species of mature forest, usually. And they support a, about 400 forest species in one way or another um, through food or shelter. If you walk into a hemlock grove in the summertime, you'll notice you walk in and it has this almost cathedral-like feeling because it's cooler and shady. And it's actually 10 degrees centigrade cooler underneath that hemlock canopy than it is above it. So it creates a nice refuge from extreme summer heat. And in the wintertime, when you walk into a hemlock grove, it feels a little warmer because that evergreen foliage blocks the wind. And so it's a good refuge in the winter as well from harsh winter conditions. In addition to being good habitat and providing some, some services for terrestrial species, hemlocks also provide some, what we call ecosystem services, like habitat or other useful things for our aquatic system. Hemlocks hold snow on the ground later into the spring than their deciduous um, 
neighbors. And so you get cold water going into your streams later into the spring. They also provide, when they're growing right over the streams, they provide some pretty dense direct shade. That helps keep our streams cool, which is important for our cold water fish that we love, like our brook trout. Um, they also tend to pull water out of the ground more in the spring and fall than our deciduous trees. And they don't pull as much water out of the ground in the summertime when we're in drought condition. And so having hemlocks on the landscape helps even out um, stream flows year round because they're not pulling as much water during our drought times and they're actively pulling, transpiring and pulling water out of the ground when we have an overabundance of water in the spring and fall. And um, at least three quarters of New York's forests are on private land, much as it is in the Skinny Atlas watershed which is why it's so important that we talk to, to folks like you about what you, what you might consider doing for hemlock conservation. Because we don't want our, our forests to look like this. This is Pisgah National Forest in the Southern Appalachians and all those gray, what we call gray ghosts are dead hemlocks um, that were taken out by this bug, the hemlock oleodelgin, which is an invasive hemlock pest. Let me take a step back and talk a little bit about where hemlocks grow in the world. This is where hemlocks um, are endemic in the world, mostly Asia and North America. Um, hemlock oleodelgid is native out here in Asia and has also been on the west coast of the United States for hundreds of thousands of years. And so in those ecosystems, there's lots of things that have adapted to eat hemlock oleodelgid, and the trees have had time to adapt to them. But over on the east coast of the US, we've got these two beautiful hemlock species, eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock in the south. And we didn't have a piercing sucking insect like this in our ecosystem until about the turn of the last century. And so we don't have any predators that eat, eat the HWA out here and our trees are not adapted to this kind of damage. HWA entered New York in down in the city, spread its way north, although um, if you look up here at Rochester and Buffalo, you see some lighter colors there. Those were infestations that were started separately from um, infested trees being planted out um, from, from nurseries that were in the south that, that came in and infested. Oops, wrong way. Um, then it moved up through Hudson Valley, the Catskills, Finger Lakes, and now it's um, also up here in Lake George, we're very sorry to report, and also moving into the Tug Hill region and spreading through Western New York. This is the Finger Lakes, uh, your home prism. Part, PRISM being a partnership for regional invasive species management. They're an excellent group that does a lot of work, including on hemlock oleodelgin in this, our area. The red dots are where HWA has been confirmed, and the green dots are where somebody has surveyed and not found HWA. We have an incredible group of volunteers just to the east of you, the HWA, Central New York HWA hunters. And, and they did a lot of survey on your lake and also um, up here. In, in this area. That's a lot of the green and red dots here. Some of the newest finds have been up here on the lake shore of Lake Ontario, which has been a discouraging development in the last two years. And this is right here around the lake. Um, lots of HWA, south end of the lake. Um, and then these, all these reports north of the lake are within the last couple of years. Oh, I would expect that you guys should start looking all around the lake for HWA at this time. So what is this bug? When we look at it out there in the landscape, it looks like this white woolly bundle on the hemlock needles at the base of the twigs. Um, that is the wool that these guys grow around themselves, probably to prevent themselves from experiencing extreme temperature, and also um, serves as an egg sac for them, for their, for their eggs. If you strip away that 
wool and look at the creature underneath a very strong microscope, this is what they look like. Um, these, they, these pores are where they, where they produce their wool. And then this um, child's silly straw looking thing is their piercing sucking mouth parts that they stick down into the twig. And then they feed on the starches that the tree stores for its own use. We don't think it's the um, actual removal of the starches that kills the trees. We think it's the tree walling off the wound that that creates to prevent infection from coming in that blocks up the um, tissues that they use to get energy and, and nutrients and water around the, the twig. And then they can't make any new growth out of the end of the twig, which is where hemlocks grow. And then after a few years, they die because they can't, they can't pr produce more food because they don't have any new needles. In the south, trees are dying in four to 10 years. Um, up here in the north, we've been fortunate because we've had nice cold winters. You need at least uh, negative five degrees, usually negative 10 or negative 15 um, to have a really good high mortality HWA event in the winter. Um, and we historically have had a lot of those. Um, and because of that, our trees have been living longer. And in New York, it's more like six to 20 years for our hemlock to succumb to HWA. Um, we've seen some pretty impressive damage in the last few years when we had some pretty mild winters though. So we, we, increasingly can't necessarily rely on that. HWA has two generations a year. They lay eggs in the summer, which hatch, and then they go into like a summer hibernation that's called estivation right here through the summer. And then in the fall, they wake up and start growing. And then this overwintering generation lays eggs in the early spring, usually in March or April. And then their daughters grow right up without any hibernation period and lay another set of eggs that will be the next overwintering generation um, in the late spring, early summer to go back here. This is what they look like when they hatch out of their eggs. They are very, very, very small. We call them crawlers. And they, this is the one mobile sta stage of HWAs. So they crawl around until they find a new hemlock twig at the base of the needle and put their mouth part in. And after that, they can't move again. And if you remove them, they actually die. Um, they can't make a new hole for, for a feeding after they have settled, which is useful because that means um, we, are, we have to be careful we're in, when we're in the woods from April to June. But outside of that, we can move with confidence through these forests and not worry too much about spreading this particular pest. This is what they look like when they're in that summer estivation period, sort of like a poppy seed with a little tutu on. Um, there they are. Then you can see why it's a little difficult to find them in the summer. They're just really small um, and hard to see. The wool from last year's HWA though hangs onto the tree and then you'll be able to see it for at least another year. So if you're not in a very new infestation, you can go out year round and look for HWA because you'll be able to see the remains of the previous winter generation on the tree. There they are, little black poppy seeds. And then when they're actively feeding and growing and making wool in the fall, winter and spring, this is what they look like. Um, this very woolly textured white bundles on the twig at the base of the needle. And here you can see up here, these are the scraps of last year's HWA hanging on. Each adult, so in North America, all we have is HWA females. Um, adults have very complicated life cycles that involve five different generations and three of HWA's generations depend on a tree we don't have here. But we only have asexual reproduction here. E every single one of our HWA is female and each one of them can lay 50 to 100 eggs. And um, here's the adult 
with the wool pulled away so you can see it. There's another adult, and these sort of eurexy looking bundles are the eggs. This April, May, June. All right, so the reason this is such a problem on the East Coast, to summarize, asexual reproduction, any individual HWA that arrives in a new location can make a new infestation. Two generations a year, um, which gives you two opportunities for exponential growth and no native predators of this species. And that's why we have these um, huge populations like this, where you have HWA on every available settling location on our trees, and that's what's killing our trees. What do you do about HWA? There's really two options at this time. You can um, do chemical management, which we think of as a short-term strategy, um, but it is right now it is the strategy for saving trees that are currently on the landscape. In the long term, um, the development of biological control is going to be critical if we're going to keep hemlocks as a functioning part of our ecosystem on the East Coast. Um, in New York, we mostly use basal bark application where you um, spray the treatment onto the first six feet of the bark, unless you're within a certain distance of water, in which case we you usually go with stem injection. You actually inject the treatment directly into the trunk of the tree. Um, the two options that we have are imidacloprid. Um, imidacloprid is a slow acting chemical. It takes about a year to get all the way through the tree and start protecting the tree from HWA. But then it lasts. Um, anywhere from three to seven years with an average of about five years. Binotefuran is the other option. It starts working within just a few weeks and then it's gone in a year. Now, it's also three times as expensive as imidacloprid. Um, so when we are in a situation where we have an old growth tree or a very heavy infestation where the trees are already in decline and they need immediate rescue or a very, very sick tree, um, uh, it's a good idea to apply both uh, because then the tree gets immediate relief and also long-term protection. If you are paying attention and you catch an infestation early, uh, before your trees start to experience damage, then you can just use imidacloprid, which is much less expensive. So that's a, one good reason to be getting out there and checking your trees for HWA so you can, you can um, do the more efficient management. Um, imidacloprid has several different ways it can be applied. Diotrephurin is only available as a basal bark application in New York, and it can only be applied by a certified pesticide applicator. Biological control is what we hope is going to save our trees in the long term. Um, a biological control means finding a predator or a pathogen or a parasitoid that will um, kill the pest that you're trying to deal with. It could be a weed, um, like with uh, purple loose strife. There has been a very successful biological control for purple loose strife in the eastern US. Winter moth has had an incredibly successful biological control program um, for that, which is why nobody hears about winter moth. It's here, it's invasive, but it's being managed by biological control. In the Adelgid system that we're working in, um, we don't have any parasitoids or pathogens that are effective and targeted enough to introduce into a new ecosystem. We only work with predators of HWA. This is a long-term solution. You um, find the right set of safe things that you can um, introduce to deal with your HWA, and then you wait for the populations to build up until they can bring the HWA population down to a level where our trees can survive their infestation. It should work at a landscape scale, which we could never do with chemical treatments. Um, but 
Biological control research takes a really long time. You have to be super careful and it's just a very slow process. So research is still underway. There, our, work, our lab is working in New York. Other labs are working all across the Eastern seaboard on this. And uh, we're hoping to find a long-term solution for this pest. One of the things we work with is Laracobius beetles. Um, the ones we mostly work with are from the Pacific Northwest, Laracobius nigrinus. We've been releasing them since 2009. And we are happy to say, report that we have establishment at 11 sites and counting in New York, mostly in warmer areas, mostly 6A or warmer, um, and several in the Finger Lakes region, although we haven't found them in Skinny Atlas yet. And there's the Laracobius doing their thing, eating all the HWA on a twig. And here's our establishment sites as of last year. Um, the other group that we work with are Leucotaraxis silverflies. It's actually the larvae of these pretty flies that, that eat HWA. They feed on spring generation, so that gives us a winter, somebody controlling that winter exponential growth with the Laracobius, and hopefully somebody controlling the spring exponential growth with the Leucotaraxis. So we're hoping they'll work together. They eat the eggs of HWA, and we've been working with these guys since about 2017. That's how big our flies are. They're incredibly small, and the larvae are even smaller, but they really are voracious for HWA eggs. This, this is the larvae right here. Yeah, there's the HWA eggs. And this is our release sites um, across New York so far. We have released these in the, finger, in, in the Skinny Atlas watershed, um, but it was one of our very first releases uh, many, many, many years ago, 2015. So if you have HWA on your property, um, what do you do? How do you, how do you plan for hemlock conservation on your property? Which trees do you save? We built a tool for this if you want to if you want to work with it, um, that will help walk you through some of the terrestrial, um, terrestrial and aquatic factors to consider when you're thinking about which hemlocks are most important on your property from an ecological perspective, some just stand traits to think about, and um, also includes things like, you know, where do you spend time on your property? Which, which hemlocks are most important to you? what their cultural values. And then um, sustainable sustainability as in which trees are likely to stay on the landscape in the long term. Um, and when you're looking at a multiple, multiple property scenario, which ones are protected from being cut down. So to wrap up my section, um, it's, it's a good time to be surveying this time of year. And it's a good idea to survey so that you know what's happening on your property that you can start thinking about hemlock conservation and um, act early so that you can do the most efficient treatment options that are available. HWA treatments are really the only thing that will save the trees that are growing right now. We just don't have a biological control that will save trees this year and next year when where there is HWA right now and damage is happening. HWA treatments are critical, critical a critical short-term tool for hemlock conservation. And in the long term, we're really hoping we'll be able to put together a biological control solution that will keep those hemlocks on the landscape and help them survive HWA in the long term. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me and thanks for um, having me here to talk to you all. We've got a website, Facebook, Instagram, or you can email us at this email address. This email goes to me and my director, Mark Whitmore, and Nick Dietschler, our field manager. So of the three of us, hopefully someone will have an answer. And with that, I yield back the remainder of my time. For the next <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. That was a very good uh, presentation there. And I noticed we have uh, some 
questions coming in, the Q&A questions. It's like we had, I was uh, jotting down the first three, but I'll continue to write down them as they come in. But it looks like we have some good questions coming in con concerning your presentation. Would the next speakers mind if I, if I type some answers in the chat while they're presenting? Would that be okay? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, because it seems like very specific questions. Um, so now, um, thank you again, Carrie. And we're going to move to our second speaker. And our second speaker is Teresa Link. She is a technician at the Onondaga County Soil and Water Conservation District, where she manages the Onondaga County Ash Tree Management Strategy, as well as the district, the district's HWA program. She is an ISA arborist and a New York State DEC pesticide applicator. So at this time, we will turn the program over to Teresa Link. Hi, everyone. Oops. Okay, did that come up? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so again, um, as Tom said, my name is Teresa and I work at Onondaga County Soil and Water. So um, in our office, we also house the Scanalis Lake Watershed Ag Program. Um, and because of that, we kind of, um, back in 2020, decided, hey, let's branch out and write a grant for hemlock treatment. Um, so it kind of seemed like there had been hemlock in the area for a while, but no one, individuals were doing some things, but some of the like land trust properties weren't having anything done on them. So it was like, oh, let's do that. Um, so we got the grant and this is kind of what I'm gonna be talking about. It's just our progress in the watershed through that grant. Okay, so first up, sorry, it's a little grainy, but um, with our grant, it was both scouting and treatment. Um, so it was for the Scanalas and Atisco Lake watersheds, both are drinking water um, sources for our county. Um, so for year one, I believe, back in 2021, I went around and I did scouting. Um, I'd walk like land trust properties, state properties, uh, city properties, things like that, municipal owned land or land trust properties. And then I also did a lot of road surveys. So I would literally just drive to where I had mapped um, hemlocks and I'd look up out of the car and see if I could see hemlocks, which it made me, I was allowed to cover so much of an area. So you see all of the, the roads that are in orange, I did. In Skinny Atlas, it looks like I didn't do a lot, but it's because people had already done a lot in the area, but a Tisco actually was like an underserved watershed for looking at hemlock. Um, like one person had, or two people had looked for hemlock really adelgid. Um, There wasn't really much serving happening and I went there and I found it. Um, so we've kind of been all over both watersheds we treat more in Skinny Atlas just because there's a lot more opportunities there. Um, and we've treated once in Atisco, but. Okay, so when we're out there scouting, um, as I hope some of you on this have done. So on the right, you'll see typical HWA, what you find. On the left, I just wanna bring this up because I have seen it in the Skinny Atlas watershed. Um, it's very hard to see it. This is called a elongate hemlock scale. And you'll see that it's like, um, it's on the needle itself. It's not at the base of the needle. So as Carrie was saying, like it's very, very important. It feeds at the base of the needle. Um, so if you see this, it's on the needle itself. Um, there's still a thing in IMAP where you can put it as that you found it, um, but it's not as important as each viewing. Okay, so overall, our grant was to treat 21,000 inches in both watersheds. Um, most of the treatment to be done in Skinny Atlas, as I said. So in 2021, that was our first year treating. We did 405 trees. Um, we treated at Bahar, High Vista, and Hemlock Hollow, which is a fire lane on the west side, about halfway down. And then this year, we worked out all, or last year, 2022, we worked out all the kinks, so we actually um, well over doubled our treatment, 
and we again treated more at Bahar. We went over to a Tisco Lake Preserve, and then the rest are all in Skinny Atlas. So High Hickory, we treat at the Albany is Bakker. Um, Seeing my land trust on property, we treated at, and then Hemlock Hollow, and then Basin Brook, which is on the east side, just south of the Bakker Road area. Um, and then the rest is just kind of to familiarize everyone with treatment options. So if you want to hire someone to treat, um, this is what you're going to see. So hopefully your applicator has all their PPE on. Um, this is a spraying for the basil bark. Um, so all we do is we spray it about four and a half feet from the soil line down to the base of the tree. Um, it's this white liquid that yes, it stays on the tree for a couple of days. So don't freak out. Um, it just absorbs through the bark. And after like a good rainfall or something, you won't see it at all. Um, we, which I don't know if anyone's seen these when you're out hiking, but we put up signage. Um, you have to, depending, if it's in a forested setting that's going to be commercially logged, um, there's different New York state regulations regarding signage than if it's like in your lawn, but your applicator should know that. Um, and then on the right, so this was, I think, taken two days after treatment. So you see it still has that white appearance to it, just so you know it stays on for a little bit. Um, and then with the grant, um, we also had to do some signage, which we made these really, really nice um, graffiti proof interpretive signs that are going at High Hickory and Bahar. So if you guys are out hiking, um, read those, but Signage is awesome, lets everyone know, just makes them aware when they're going hiking. This is what our sign looks like. So I and an intern of mine made this. Um, just signage in general, please read it. That's why we made it. Um, okay, back to this, I should have reordered my slides a little bit, but so methods of application. So when you hire someone, uh, just be aware that there are, as Carrie says, so the basal bark spray, there's injections, there's also soil drench. So they basically just put it around the tree on the soil and there's tablets. There's little middle culprit tablets that are solid that they can just put in there. But soil drench and the tablets, there's a new law banning neonicotinoids, which is what a middle culprit and dinotoxin are, I believe. And that might be changing soon. Um, as a note, when people are really afraid of pesticides and neonics, because um, they affect the bees, hemlocks are a wind pollinated tree. So they, it does not affect the bees. So don't be afraid, treat your trees. Um, this is Carrie went over it, I should get rid of this, but this is just, there's a whole bunch of different aminoculprids and dianteferins out there. They're all the same, doesn't matter what you're, applicator uses. Um, and then real quick, if you need to find yeah. someone, you can contact um, the SLA or I. We have um, a little Excel thing that I redo every once in a while. And all I do is I go on the state's website and I type in category two, so that's forest. Um, and I just take all the information of the businesses that are category two. And you can, do this your own. Um, you just type in like DEC pesticide portal and you can find all this and you can do it. But we also have this. Um, so we keep this so you can just ask either of us and you can just find some in your area. And that's all I have for you guys. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Teresa. And again, if you have any questions that you would like that are specific to Teresa's presentation, you can enter those in the Q&A section. And I noticed it seemed like we had a few come in uh, while you were speaking, Teresa. Uh, it seemed like the first nine were for the first speaker, and it looks like 10, 11, and now that we have another one, 12. It looks like nine through 12 would be directed specifically toward, towards your presentation, Teresa. 
So now we're going to transition uh, to two more speakers, a little panel section. And um, the first one is going to be Frank Moses, who is the executive director for the Skinny Atlas Lake Association, or commonly known as the SLA. SLA has been involved with managing the aquatic invasives, invasives since 2007, helping prevent new additional aquatic invasives since 2012, and recently started investing in protecting the eastern hemlocks from HWA through the SLA's Legacy Fund in 2020. And joining Frank will be Dr. Buzz Roberts. He is the board vice president for the SLA, co-chair of the Skinny Atlas Lake ecology team and the SLA volunteer program lead for both the aquatic invasive, invasive species prevention and coordination in the protection of the Skinny Atlas Lakes critical eastern hemlock forest. So um, welcome both of these speakers and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Tom. I'm just going to get the uh, slideshow going here. Uh, is that uh, showing up for everybody? No, maybe not. Yep. I'll do a resume. Well, I hit another button and I'm not sure what happened there. Let me stop sharing and uh, close one and then start the other. I had it. Let's try this again. Yeah, it's showing saving our hemlock heritage. Great. Okay, I think I think we got it. Thanks. Um, uh, many thanks to the Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, Camille Marcotte, uh, who's been the uh, watershed coordinator and uh, or watershed educator for Skinny Atlas Lake, has been uh, around. Uh, I think I first met uh, Camille at the 2020 uh, program on on Hemlock Willia Delgid, where she brought Steve Kinney in from. Uh, the Central New York HWA hunters and had a, a wonderful program uh, at, at the Central New York Land Trust uh, at their offices. And then we went over to High Hickory. And I just wanted to share this really, I wanted to speak on some of the SLA Legacy Fund. Uh, thanks to all the donors that have helped with that uh, and where we're uh, collaborating on the different sites and talking about where SLA is prioritizing the support of those sites, but also talking about the people uh, that have really been behind this. And, and what's clear from Carrie and Teresa and Cornell Cooperative is that this is an all hands on deck effort. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, partners and, and great news to share and, and a good testament to how much our community cares for this. And it was at that uh, program back in March of 2020 uh, that I met Roseanne Gay, who was waiting in the parking lot um, of High Hickory. And I said, oh, are you going on the hike uh, for Hemlock Willie Delgie? She says, I'm, I'm very familiar with it. I'm just waiting to see if someone from the Skinny Atlas Lake Association is here uh, to know that how much we care about this as a risk. And we, we looked into it and looked at, uh, you know, the southern third that I'll get into of this lake is uh, becoming infested, and we've seen some of those different uh, map markers and wanted to see that that things got done, uh, connected with Dr. Dana Hall, who's on today, um, and also Dr. Buzz Roberts, who's here uh, to see if what we can do uh, working with our, our partners and, and carrying the torch a bit there. Um, and it was, I think, believe at a meeting, uh, we were over by Russell's Landing, where uh, working with Soil Water Conservation District on some hydro seeding, which is basically revegetating ditches. Uh, we connected with Mark Berger at Soil Water, and we were looking at different projects we could work together on. And the first at top of our both our list was Hemlock Willia Delgid, and that's when we uh, saw some use of some legacy funds to support the grant development. Uh, for a bit of what uh, Teresa shared, and also wanted to recognize uh, the Batisco Lake uh, Preservation Association. Uh, Margie Creamer is on today, and thank Margie and the support uh, for that, uh, working with Soil and Water to see that that grant development uh, occurred, and we all worked together to see that uh, come through, and then Teresa's do been doing a phenomenal job uh, at managing those properties. 
Um, so this is uh, talking about the, our strategy is related a lot to um, our mission in terms of the water quality uh, and protecting uh, you know, the waters, which, which has a lot to do with the land. Uh, and I, I can't talk about the history only with Cornell Cooperative, but also back in the 1970s. Uh, this is a, a picture of, on the left here, uh, on the left on the boat at the helm is Dr. Robert Werner. And back in the 70s, uh, Dr. Werner said, if we lose the hemlocks, we lose the lake. Uh, and this is also Dr. Bill Dean uh, uh, sampling uh, a hab that was on September 4th of 2019. Uh, Bill and Buzz are both our co um, committee chairs of the lake ecology team. Um, but this has been uh, a, a lake-wide effort. Uh, folks like Bob Duckett in the community um, that have really wanted to see us uh, you know, take an effort to care for these hemlocks. Um, so, and in, in related to these HABs is we want to try and see all of our best strategies, a good diverse portfolio of reducing uh, sediment into the lake. And there's not a lot of engineering solutions that come in these steep ravines of uh, Skinny Atlas. So protecting our hemlocks and the roots of that is, is critical. Um, so this is 10 mile ravine. You can see these steep slopes of the hemlocks here. Uh, again, uh, this is mostly the uh, uh, southern third of the lake. Uh, and uh, this is a map that we brought uh, Will McCall. He's a graduate student, since graduated with a master's at SUNY ESF, the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, Will had some uh, work on Lake George and, and Hemlock Willie Adelgid and some good mapping skills. So we brought Will in. Uh, to help map. These are the coniferous forests, which uh, many of these are the hemlocks, and these red dots here are uh, similar to some of the red dots you saw on the IMAP invasives that uh, we overlaid to see where we could prioritize, which is these steep ravines uh, to protect the roots so we have uh, soil that's staying in the lake so we can avoid, at least mitigate and reduce how much of the uh, this chocolate milk that's going into our lake. Uh, this is um, from 2021, which was a very rainy season, we had the remnants of Tropical Storm Fred and other storm events that were wreaking havoc. And whatever we can do in these steep areas to protect our roots, uh, sustain our soils, to have less of this uh, brown stuff that's feeding our algal blooms uh, and uh, reducing the quality of our lake uh, is the name of the game. This is Roseanne Gay on the left uh, at the uh, uplands of um, uh, 10 Mile Ravine. Uh, this is Will McCall and, and Dr. Buzz Roberts uh, going from left to right. Um, and we were pleased to see that when we came there that the Soil Water Conservation District was already doing uh, a lot of the upper parts of 10 Mile Ravine and noticing that we want to work and collaborate to put extra dollars towards where it's more expensive in the steep ravines where our treatment professionals like Zeb Strickland, who's online today, who helped with this site and the other sites I'll show, uh, would rope in, uh, do the basal bark treatment. And then as you get down closer to the water line, uh, there are projects that ha actually had to have uh, the injection. And that's all about trying to protect our soils, protect the lake uh, to do this the best way. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the different properties uh, between 2021, uh, which was mainly Randall Golf and then uh, mostly 2022 of the uh, SLA legacy fund supported uh, properties on top of what we learned from Teresa. Uh, and then also I'll share a bit of what the DEC is doing, but uh, we're, we're not done, uh, but we're still looking at these steep ravine areas uh, uh, based off of that map. Uh, and then I'll talk about another area that's also high priority, but uh, this is just, uh, diameter breast height inches is uh, where you saw the the trees taped in those uh, shots from trees. So that's just uh, the inches of how thick the tree is. And then um, with an estimate of the, um, at least in the number of trees, plus an estimate for Randall Golf, we have to do a little math there. I've got to follow up with Zeb on, on the, uh, the specific numbers there. Um, so next I wanted to share, uh, this was recently, um, the New York State DEC, uh, Chris Sprague is now uh, with Lands and Forests for Region 7. Uh, Chris and his team at DEC did a wonderful job. This is another priority area of looking at um, uh, 
the Carpenters Falls unique area. Um, that is a huge hemlock forest in our in our lake. So again, all hands on deck of working with soil and water, working with the land trust, both Finger Lakes Land Trust and Central York Land Trust, looking at working with all the uh, thanks to all the landowners that are participating, um, you know, in these projects and the um, as I mentioned, Atisco Lake Preservation Association and Owasco Watershed Lake Association. So we've got a nice buffer of our lakes to our east and west uh, that we share forests on uh, and the efforts there. So um, just wanted to highlight that. Uh, again, we're looking at the steep ravines, but also uh, looking at a strategy of reducing sediment. Of, uh, these are some examples of the ghost trees that Carrie shared earlier that these are on the banks down in uh, Cayuga County along the um, west side of the lake to the south. And uh, this is just an example. This is not specific from hemlocks dying, but this is an example where trees were moved at the top of the banks and then the bank failed and a lot of uh, sediment went into the lake. Um, and that's why we wanna protect uh, you know, these continuous, even these thin strips that run along these steep banks and looking at those as priority areas. Um, this is a bit of what Teresa shared. We'll be getting this up on our website. I'll make sure uh, connect with Camille and see that it's on Scan Lake Info. It'll be on the SLA website. I'll put some links in our uh, in the chat, but I, I am gonna I have to update a little bit for this afternoon uh, to get ready. So please check back then. Um, but we'll share that uh, site that Teresa mentioned. Uh, this is the uh, I'll put this in the chat box. Uh, this link will give you to that portal for the DC. Uh, where you can go to immediately once you get that in the chat. I'll, I'll pop that in. Um, and that's it. I may have uh, missed a couple. I want to make sure I thanked everyone. Uh, certainly the New York State Hemlock Initiative, Cornell Cooperative, there's the support from the City of Syracuse, Onondaga County Soil Water Conservation District, the DEC, uh, all of our donors to the SL Legacy Fund, uh, the participating landowners, uh, Aula and the Tisco Lake Preservation Association, Zeb Strickland, Roseanne Gay, uh, and the participating land trust. Uh, one of the things that you see all those treatment professionals is that it's very difficult to find uh, good local uh, ones that will travel and, and do a good job. And it is it is a one of the restrictions of the spring and fall that you can um, uh, treat uh, when the windows that you can treat, but also the uh, amount of vendors and treatment professionals that do a good job is very limited. Uh, so we can only uh, get to so much, but I think that is quite the need of while we're waiting for uh, biocontrol viability, uh, we do want to have this Band-Aid approach to buy us some time, and we do need uh, an influx of more treatment professionals. So I hope that uh, perhaps the Environmental Bond Act and the green jobs that's coming down the pike uh, and also, um, you know, our academic institutions, maybe there could be some fast track certification programs, similar to when we needed more nurses for the health of humans, we need more uh, treatment professionals for the health of our forest. Uh, with that, I will uh, 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 acknowledge Buzz Roberts as well. Uh, Buzz has been a, a great partner as well as uh, Dr. Dana Hall on our board uh, working at this effort. And Buzz, if there's anything that you want to mentioned that I may have missed, please uh, chime in. Sure, Frank. Uh, I guess uh, Frank covered it very well. One of the things uh, that we focused on, though, are our major ravines, which are on the southern portion of our lake. As in most of the Finger Lakes, you get those steep slopes uh, to the south. So we focused on treating those hemlocks, and what's is fairly interesting, in those major ravines, in those large stands, all those hemlocks are infected. It's you know it's it's impressive. Um, so and and our uh, applicator Zeb Strickland um, has kind of advised, and what he's doing is he's using both the dinotrifran um, and the imitated clopid, um, thinking that uh, we get best results. It's more expensive to do that. Um, but his feeling is that to save these uh, trees, uh, it, uh, both treatments are, are necessary. So we're, we're working on those major tributaries. We have one more to go, Hooker uh, Ravine on the uh, southwest side. 
and then we'll start looking at the adjoining ravines. And it's going well. One of the things who Teresa brought up, the new uh, proposed New York State law to ban these neonicotinoids, uh, there is a carve out now in that bill for treatment for HWA because they realize that that treatment is localized in the trees. The neonicotinoids are a, a, a neurotoxin for insects. So bees can be affected. Uh, and that's why they're putting that ban on because that has been applied, the, the neonicotinoids have been applied to seeds for corn and for soybeans. And they'd like to get rid of that. And, uh, but the carve out does exist for HWA treatment. Great. So. I, thanks, Buzz. And, I, and I, I'll mention one other thing that Carrie mentioned earlier about the forest and under the canopy of um, the, you know, being 10 degrees cooler and just thinking about the value of our streams being cooler. We have 150 streams, these streams that are all to the one third south of our, our lake. If we can keep our streams cooler, we can keep the lake cooler, uh, which uh, has a, a relationship with the algal blooms, also has a relationship with how much uh, the milfoil and these other invasive species are growing with the warmth of water. So, uh, you know, taking part in protecting our hemlocks and, and the cool waters is a, is a big part and the uh, carbon dioxide that they take in and, you know, oxygen that they produce, um, you know, uh, reducing that greenhouse impact. So there's so much that the hemlock, uh, along with the species, that Blackburnian warbler that I absolutely love, uh, depends on hemlock forests. And the last thing, just as a call to action, is uh, you know, there's, uh, I think we had about 50 folks on today's uh, uh, presentation. This is being recorded. It is going to get distributed. And if you can send this around to your neighbors, you can talk about the importance of hemlocks. If you don't have hemlocks, but you see neighbors do, uh, please, uh, you know, talk about the importance of this and, and help us uh, reach, you know, reach beyond the choir a bit. Uh, we know everyone here is uh, out of interest and care for these hemlocks. Uh, we just want to get to folks that may have hemlocks that aren't aware of the importance yet. Um, so we uh, encourage you to talk to your neighbors, share the presentation, uh, and, and work on getting uh, more resources going. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, each and every one of you. And Carrie, thank you for jumping in there and answering a lot of those questions in the chat. Uh, you were amazing as, as far as your responses on there. I can't believe you got that much information in there in that short of time. <laughs> um, it looks like we have, let's see, um, there are just a few more. I think there was one specifically for you, Frank. It was, um, uh, Betsy was asking, has there been any contact with local town road crews about concentrating and dumping runoff water towards the lake and contributing to high erosion rates during the storms? Um, not sure what it means by uh, the, the um, road crews dumping the, the water, right. uh, but may, maybe that's in reference to, to ditching. Um, you know, I, I think looking at the uh, how water moves. I think that's a lot of collaboration with the Department of Transportation, uh, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, the highway departments. Um, but I know that this nine element plan that is uh, being worked on uh, with funds from Department of State and the Central York Regional Planning Development Board facilitating uh, Town of Skinny Alice is the lead. Uh, I believe there's uh, a lot more focus on for our ditch and culvert uh, improvements. And, uh, but if anybody does see um, the, uh, you know, any water issues of water flowing over the roads, culverts clogged, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, reach out through our contact us tab or, um, and, uh, we'll, we're pretty responsive and, and we'll at least, you know, there's a lot of different folks you can call, but if you know which road it is going to the, uh, your, your high, if you're on a town road, getting to your town highway department, if you're on a state road, getting to DOT, uh, county similar, you know, all that. There's uh, Scan Lake Info is great. The SLA website should help uh, get some answers. I hope that that helps. Um, you know, so we're we're all looking at the water uh, moving, and uh, but we're uh, we're always a good phone call away or or an email. We usually get to it uh, pretty quick. Our uh, board member Fran Fish is a good uh, is a good contact. She's our front of the line for communications there. 
Thank Nancy you, Frank. Carrie's got her hand up too. Maybe you wanted to add into that. Yes. I actually wanted to change the subject, so please finish this. Finish this Done. thought. No, no. <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, a lot of the questions in the chat are very reasonable concerns about additions of chemicals in our environment. Um, I think we're all on the same board here that none of us love the idea of adding extra chemicals to our environment. Um, it's not something that we wake up in the morning thinking, what can I spray today? You know, um, but it's important to remember that the, the trade off is not either we use these chemicals or if they stay the same. The trade off is we use these chemicals or essentially all of our hemlocks die and we have a massive change in our forests with a lot of mortality and changes, short term changes in nutrient cycling, probably long term changes in nutrient cycling in the watershed, and a lot of um, knock on effects from using the foundation species. And that's why we're all here struggling with what do we do for habitat conservation. Um, it's um, so it's important to keep that in mind when you're weighing the, the risks and rewards of treatment versus no treatment. Um, and that's certainly the reason that we're looking for a biological solution in the long term, long term being, you know, hundreds of years. I mean, it's not going to take hundreds of years, but like we can treat now, right? But we can't treat indefinitely. We have to have another solution in the long term. Um, but the long term is not next year. Um, the long term is probably not five years. Um, there's been a lot of research done on off target impacts of metacorporate on um, stream macroinvertebrates, which is which is always a concern when you're working in a really nice watershed like St. Thomas Lake. Um, soil invertebrates, um, canopy invertebrates. And so far, there's been no impact found on stream macroinvertebrates, even from the soil branch application, and we're doing that basal bark application. Um, in, in the canopy, we do see reductions for a few years in some of the species that live in the canopy, but they bounce back after a few years. And if you lose the tree, they lose their habitat entirely. Um, and so the take home message so far from the work that's been done mostly by Elizabeth McCarthy from the University of Georgia um, is there are some small target impacts of metacorporate treatment, but they are dwarfed by the impacts of losing your monster and their transitory effects. And none of them are catastrophic. Does that make sense? Okay. I think that's all I have to say on that subject, but if there are other questions. But it looks to me like the majority of our questions have been answered, but I would like if anyone has a question that has not been answered through the Q&A section, uh, if you would like to raise your hand, uh, we could maybe do another minute or so if we have not already addressed your question, but it looks like on my end, we've done a wonderful job, uh, Carrie, you did. And then also Teresa, as far as answering the questions directly through the Q&A. Um, I know this has been very informative for me. Uh, I think it's been, uh, I know it, it and it's a, a personal uh, subject for me as well as I live on the south end of uh, east side of Skinny Atlas Lake and I, I do have quite a few hemlocks on my property as well with steep ravines and gullies going through my property um, and, and I make it a point I, I walk through there almost daily and I'm constantly on the lookout for the HWA on my hemlocks and so far knock on wood I have not seen any on my hemlocks yet because I do have some really steep banks on the back end of my property but but I'm on the lookout constantly as I'm walking my dogs through the property. Um, I think this was great information today and um, I would like to give a huge thank Tom, you to our speakers. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Tom I just I did see one question uh, from Bob okay. King, uh, who asked 
uh, for treatment on private property? Does do landowners get any help in paying for the treatments? Uh, and the an the answer is is yes, uh, at least uh, through the SLA's legacy fund. And I just wanted to reiterate. Um, if there's properties that are in these priority zones, which are the steep ravine areas and also along the steep banks, uh, the steep ravine areas, I think Buzz has mentioned, uh, you know, those areas we're, we're moving around. We've identified, uh, we are working with private landowners already. We invested 23, over $23,000 uh, just in 2022 uh, towards this. Um, but the, uh, and then, where it comes to the steep bank areas, it, there's a lot of parcels of land. And that's where if you know you've got a, a swath of hemlocks and your neighbors do, what helps us is if you coordinate, uh, if you're part of a homeowners association or a group of landowners that we can try and schedule. It's like having your driveway sealed. It's, it's cheaper by the dozen if you, if you line up uh, your neighbors to have the driveway sealer come at the same time. Uh, that's kind of the strategy for the steep banks a bit. And even in the steep ravines, if we can uh, schedule someone like Zeb Strickland to come out uh, into these steep areas um, and, and hit multiple properties that are adjacent together and coordinate that. Um, but it is that we are looking at these priority zones now. Uh, but if anybody wants to uh, has hemlocks they want to care for that are in up, upland that aren't steep sloped, uh, there is that list that Teresa link uh, and uh, we can share so you can hire your uh, hire your own if um, if we're not you know down the line if we're looking at we've taken care of as many steep ravines in those areas we can graduate to uh, the other uh, other areas that aren't uh, as highest priority right now for uh, protecting sediment and soil in the steep ravines if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And and let's see, I noticed that Zeb had her hand raised. Is that the question that you just answered, Frank? I, I don't know. See. I, uh, let's see, I'm trying to unmute. unmute. Uh, there we go. Zeb, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. I just, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank Buzz and Frank and uh, Carolyn and, and everyone else. And I see Dana's on here too um, for all your support. and. Um, Great presentation, and uh, if you know, if we can fight the the great fight with using biocontrol, it can get me out of uh, climbing down these har harrowing uh, cliffs. That'd be great. So, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to add that. Uh, uh, thank you all. Thanks. All right, thank thank you, Zeb. Okay, so I think we will wrap this up. And again, I'd like to have a huge thank you to Carrie, Teresa, Frank, and Dr. Buzz Robert, Roberts for your time today. Also, I'd like to thank you for taking, everyone for taking the time out of your day to join us. Uh, please don't forget to fill out our evaluation form. I sent that to everyone in the chat. Um, Let's see, we truly appreciate it and do actually go through all of these responses and feedback and we try to incorporate it as best we can into future programs. So it is time well spent and we really do read, actually do read the evaluation forms. Uh, and uh, for just a little reminder, look out for an email from Camille with the evaluation link. If you don't get it off of this chat, she will email you this link, the recording link, and any other resources. She will send that out within a week from now. So it may not be right away. It definitely won't be today, but it will be within the week. And stay tuned. And thank you all for joining us today. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and week. And thank you again for your time and your efforts and concern for the Skinny House Lake watershed. All right. Thanks again, everyone. I appreciate it and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Bye-bye.